Billy Card Hill by Clive James. I could not build billy carts very well. Other children, most of them admittedly older than I, but some of them infuriatingly not, constructed billy carts of advanced design with skeletal hardwood frames and steel jacketed ball race wheels that screamed on the concrete footpaths like a diving stuka. The best I could manage was a sawn-off fruit box mounted on a fence-paling spine frame with drearily silent rubber wheels taken off an old pram. In such a creation, I could go at a reasonable clip down our street and twice as fast down Sunbeam Avenue, which was much steeper at the top. But even going down Sunbeam, my billy cart was no great thrill compared with the ball race models. Which, having a ground clearance of about half an inch and being almost frictionless, were able to attain tremendous velocity at low profile so that to the onlooker, their riders seemed to be travelling downhill, sitting magically just above the ground. While to the riders themselves, the sense of speed was breathtaking. After school and at weekends, boys came from all over the district to race on the Sunbeam Avenue footpaths. There would be 20 or 30 carts, two thirds of them with ball races. The noise was indescribable. It sounded like the Battle of Britain going on in somebody's bathroom. There would be about half an hour's racing before the police came. Residents often took the law into their own hands, hosing the grimmed-faced riders as they went shrieking by. Sunbeam Avenue ran parallel to Margaret Street, but it started higher and lasted longer. Carts racing down the footpath on the far side had a straight run of about a quarter of a mile all the way to the park, emitting shock waves of sound. The ball race carts would attain such speeds that it was impossible for the rider to get off. All he could do was to crash reasonably gently when he got to the end. Carts racing down the footpath on the near side could go only half as far, although very nearly as fast, before being faced with a right angled turn into Irene Street. Here, a prammed wheeled cart like mine could demonstrate its sole advantage. The traction of the rubber tyres made it possible to negotiate the corner in some style. I developed a histrionic lean over of the body and slide of the back wheels which got me around the corner unscathed, leaving black smoking trails of burnt rubber. Mastery of this trick saved me from being relegated to the ranks of the little kids, then which there was no worse fate. I had come to depend on being thought of as a big kid. Luckily, only the outstanding ball race drivers could match my fancy turn into Irene Street. Others slid straight on with a yelp of metal and a shower of sparks, braining themselves on the asphalt road. Ah! One driver scalped himself under a bread van. The Irene Street corner was made doubly perilous by Mrs. Branthwaite's poppies. Mrs. Branthwaite inhabited the house on the corner. She was a known witch, whom we often persecuted after dark by throwing gravel on her roof. It was widely believed she poisoned cats.
Certainly, she was a great ringer-up of the police. In retrospect, I can see that she could hardly be blamed for this, but her behaviour seemed, at the time, like irrational hatred of children. She was a renowned gardener. Her front yard was like the cover of a seed catalogue. Extending her empire, she had flower beds even on her two front strips one on the Sunbeam Avenue side and the other on the Irene Street side, i.e. on both outside edges of the famous corner. The flower beds held the area's best collection of poppies. She had been known to phone the police if even one of these was illicitly picked. At the time I am talking about, Mrs. Branthwaite's poppies were all in bloom. It was essential to make the turn without hurting a single hair of a poppy's head. Otherwise, the old lady would probably drop the telephone and come out shooting. Usually, when the poppies were in bloom, nobody dared make the turn. I did, not out of courage, but because in my ponderous cart there was no real danger of going wrong. The daredevil leaning over and the dramatic skid were just icing on the cake. I should have left it at that, but got ambitious. One Saturday afternoon, when there was a particularly large turnout, I got sick of watching the ball race carts howling to glory down the far side. I organised the slower carts, like my own, into a train. Every cart, except mine, was deprived of its front axle and loosely bolted to the cart in front. The whole assembly was about a dozen carts long with a big box cart at the back. This back cart I dubbed the chuck wagon, using terminology I had picked up from the Hopalong Cassidy serial at the pictures. I was the only one alone in his cart. Behind me, there were two or even three to every cart until you got to the chuck wagon, which was crammed full of little kids, some of them so small that they were holding toy koalas and sucking dummies. From its very first run down the far side, my super cart was a triumph. Even the adults who had been hosing us called their families out to marvel as we went steaming by. On the super cart's next run, there was still more to admire, since even the top flight ball race riders had demanded to have their vehicles built into it, thereby heightening its tone, swelling its passenger list and multiplying its already impressive output of decibels. Once again, I should have left well alone. The thing was already famous. It had everything but a dining cart. Why did I ever suggest that we should transfer it to the near side and try the Irene Street turn? With so much inertia, the supercart started slowly, but it accelerated like a piano falling out of a window. Long before we reached the turn, I realised that there had been a serious miscalculation. The miscalculation was all mine, of course. Sir Isaac Newton would have got it right. It was too late to do anything except pray. Leaning into the turn, I skidded my own cart safely around the usual way. The next few segments followed me, but with each segment describing an arc of slightly larger radius than the one in front. First, gradually, then, with stunning finality, the monster lashed its enormous tail. The air was full of flying ball bearings. Bits of wood, big kids, little kids, koalas and dummies. Most disastrously of all, it was also full of poppy petals. Not a bloom escaped the scythe. Those of us who could still run scattered to the winds, dragging our wounded with us. The police spent hours visiting all of the parents in the district. 
warning them that the Billy Cart era was definitely over. It was a police car that took Mrs. Branthwaite away. There was no point waiting for the ambulance. She could walk all right. It was just that she couldn't talk. She stared straight ahead, her mouth slightly open.